Hi everybody, it's good to be back with you. Uh, it's been uh, quite a while, I guess at least a year since I've recorded one of these uh, videos for my 545 class. And uh, since that time, COVID's gone crazy in the world. So um, I'm recording this for my current class in 545 because I'm teaching this class online uh, for the first time. And um, today we're going to talk about something that is pretty important when it comes to understanding ground motions and our ability to predict them. You have um, quite a lot of experience now with uh, predicting uh, earthquake ground motions using attenuation relationships. You should be to the point, or, or at least have had some experience now, computing ground motions for scenario earthquakes, so that's a deterministic analysis. And you've even dipped your toes into the computation of probabilistic analyses. Uh, and so those are um, lots of fun, to say the least. And so what I want to talk about today, though, is um, understanding a little bit more about some factors that can affect ground motions uh, on a local site level. Um, there's, there's still a lot of, of things at the local site that can affect the, the intensity of the ground motions that are experienced. And a lot of these things can't really uh, adequately or effectively be captured inside of just the attenuation relationships themselves. And so uh, we're going to just walk through a few of those today. Uh, that's my goal. Um, attenuation relationships are getting better at accounting for more of these site effects. But uh, to date, we still have to perform separate analyses to account for a lot of these effects. So let's just jump into it. We're going to discuss local side effects today that can significantly affect ground motions. So what are the side effects that uh, we're going to discuss? And, and by the way, before I jump into that, I am recording this from my house in my kitchen, and uh, I've got lots of kids. I've got six kids, and they're going to be coming home from school here soon. So it might get a little bit crazy. Uh, my dog might bark. Uh, if that's the case, just smile and laugh and, and move on because this is all part of the craziness that I and you and everyone else is dealing with in this COVID pandemic. Here are the local side effects that we're going to talk about. Soil amplification or, or site response, near source effects and directivity, topography or topographic effects, and basin effects. So um, each of these, we're, we're not going to dive very deep into each of these to the sense that you're going to be an expert, but uh, I'm just going to teach you enough to make you dangerous and, and just so you understand the concept uh, because even just understanding the concept is incredibly important in, in decision making today. So um, let's discuss soil amplification, but um, <clears throat> I think that the easiest way to understand what soil amplification is if, if we just look at a whiteboard. So I'm going to uh, delete what I had on there before. And let's just, let's just do a simple comparison, okay? Let's just say we have um, the, the actual, and then we have the model. So for the actual, I have some bedrock and on top of the bedrock, I have maybe some soil. It might be level, it might not. In fact, let's just, for simplicity's sake, let's assume it's level. And then I uh, subject this bedrock to some sort of ground motion. So there is a, an earthquake that happens. The bedrock shakes horizontally and vertically, back and forth, up and down. And uh, those motions transmit all the way and at the ground surface, there is also motion. But that motion that occurs at the ground surface might be different than the motion in the rock. And why is that? Well, because we can see why if we just draw a model. So let's say I have rock or a table. 
And on this table, I have a, um, a spring. I've never drawn a spring before. I think that's pretty good. And on this spring, I have some mass. And let's say the same thing happens. So uh, I shake my table according to some ground motion. And then uh, my mass also will respond in some way. It will have some different motion. And that motion is, is really a function of the spring that that mass is sitting on. It's also a function of the mass, of course. But uh, this, this spring is going to have a natural period or, or a natural frequency that it vibrates at. And so, um, Understanding how motions are transmitted from the table or the rock through the spring uh, up to the mass at the top of the spring, that is what we're talking about when we say sight response. All right, so going back, soil amplification or sight response. If, if we look at how that spring or how that soil can amplify the base motions in the bedrock, uh, this, this figure right here shows the amplification that happens at certain frequencies uh, depending on the stiffness or the, the natural frequency or natural period of that spring or the soil. So here at, uh, for instance, site A, we can say, okay, maybe this is a really, um, this is a, a softer site because notice at a low frequency, it, or it is amplified quite a bit. And how much is it amplified? Well, it's amplified greater than a factor of six. So that means that um, ground motions in the table that are at the frequency of 2.5 hertz that go into that spring or that soil, when they come out the other end, those are amplified by more than 600%. That's pretty crazy when you think about it. Can we have deamplification? Yeah, sure. So check out what's happening down here at say a frequency of 20. So that's really high frequency stuff. It's less than an amplification ratio of one. So anything that's less than one is getting filtered or deamplified. For my uh, second site here, say I have a totally different site, a totally different representative spring. Uh, that may amplify at a different frequency, in this case, 10 hertz. So all that's saying is that uh, site B tends to resonate at a frequency of 10 hertz, and site A tends to resonate at a frequency of 2.5 hertz. So understanding how different sites um, resonate, understanding what their natural periods or natural frequencies are, will help us predict soil amplification. This is a really important lesson to learn, and um, there was no event that taught this more effectively to the earthquake engineering community than the 1985 Mexico City earthquake. And, and I was heavily involved in the earthquake reconnaissance following the 2017 Mexico City earthquake, and we saw the exact same stuff happening. Here's what happened in Mexico City in 1985. An earthquake occurred uh, well over 100 miles, almost 200 miles away from Mexico City. And those ground motions traveled all the way to Mexico City and they entered uh, the Mexico City Basin through the rock that, that um, lays beneath it. And the motions themselves were pretty darn small. In fact, here's the response spectrum that was recorded of uh, the ground motions in the rock. And you can see that the peak motions occurred between one, a period of one and two seconds, generally. Looks like there were almost uh, two peaks, so it was bimodal. And the, the peak accelerations were just a little bit over uh, 0.1 G. So, you know, 10% G, that, that's pretty small. That, in general, that would not damage m many structures at all in, in modern structure or uh, modern construction today. 
uh, especially in a modern city like Mexico City. But the freaky thing is Mexico City has uh, this stuff in here. Freaky, soft, gooey clay that comes from uh, an old lake that was called Lake uh, Texcoco. The, the lake is largely not there anymore. I think there's a teeny little remnant of it left. But uh, that, that clay is mucky, it is soft, it is sticky, it's gooey. Uh, and to a geotechnical engineer, it's like Christmas because it's just fascinating stuff. Anyway, uh, this, this basin in Mexico City is filled with this gooey clay. And there were um, several ground motion recording instruments located throughout the Mexico City Basin. There was one located uh, in, in this location. If we just do a cross-section across the Mexico City Basin, there's one uh, in, in this location, there's one in this location, uh, and then there's one in this location. And each of these have different names, SCT, CAF, and CAO. Uh, these are the names of the ground motion recording um, stations. Oh, hold on. Hey, Chad, I'm recording a lesson. Can we be quiet? Awesome. Thanks. All right. Check out the response spectra from each of these uh, stations. So even though the, the same input went in uh, beneath the soil in each of these locations, the output was drastically different. Here at this location of about uh, 37 meters of thickness of that gooey clay, here's the response spectrum that resulted. And, and what we see is that at a period of around two seconds, there was massive amplification to the point where uh, we almost had uh, about 0.8 G of acceleration at that period. Uh, and as the clay got thicker, the spring, the, 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 this model spring got softer and softer and softer. So it started to amplify at increasingly higher periods. And so you can see now the peak is about two and a half to three seconds. And then here where the, the clay is, is even thicker, about 57 meters, that spring is really soft. So now we start to see kind of two uh, peaks start to develop. And the, the amplitude of these peaks is much less uh, than the peak over here. But still, I mean, here we are at, a, at about a period of four seconds. So what does that mean? Well, in a ring, or in certain sections of Mexico City, and it kind of formed a, the shape of a ring, which makes sense because it happens where the soil is right around 40 meters thick. Uh, we got this big spike at about a 0.2 second period. And interestingly, buildings that are between about 12 to 20 stories in height, somewhere around 15 stories in height, guess what their natural period is approximately? Yeah, it's about the same as that peak. So um, now you're, you're in trouble because your building is in tune with the soil and the soil is in tune with the earthquake. Everything's in tune and now you start to really shake and rattle and destroy these buildings. So buildings that were um, in this region where the soil was about that thick and that had natural periods around, point, uh, around two seconds uh, they collapsed, and it killed a lot of people, thousands of people. But we learned an important lesson from this tragedy. We learned about soil amplification and site response. And this earthquake, uh, followed by the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake in California four years later, really kicked off a ton of research in the area of site response. So here's the things that, uh, in general, we can state, okay? Th these curves here are curves developed by uh, the grandfather of uh, geotechnical earthquake engineering, Harry Seed, published in 1976. 
And he just uh, gathered a whole bunch of uh, earthquake records on different types of materials. Uh, 15 records on soft to medium clays and sands. 30 records on uh, very thick cohesionless or sandy soils. And 31 records on very stiff or dense soils. And then he had 28 records on rock. And what he did was he just computed the, the mean or the average response spectra from all of these records in their respective categories. And we see that the rock, rock has a, its peak at a much lower response or a much lower period, excuse me. So that means that it tends to resonate at higher frequencies. And it's really stiff soil, it, it's a, it resonates at a little bit higher period than rock, but it still has a similar shape to rock, except notice that uh, there is quite a bit of amplification relative to the rock. And then uh, the softer we go, all the way out to the soft and medium clays, we tend to see that the response spectra stretch out in this direction such that high period stuff, stuff at, at, greater, at periods greater than half a second or greater than one second, those are the, the periods that really start to get amplified. And so the, the lesson that um, Harry Seed really tried to teach the world is that site response matters. The types of soils that you build on matter. Not all soil is the same. And it doesn't just depend on the fault and the size of the earthquake, but it, it depends on the soil that you're built on as well. So uh, in general, softer soils are going to amplify high period ground motions. And harder soils or, or stiffer soils and rock are going to amplify low period ground motions. And the, 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 the opposite is true. Rock and harder soils are going to filter or de-amplify high period motions, and soft soils are going to filter or de-amplify um, low period ground motions. So how do we account for soil amplification? A couple of things. Uh, well, the, the, the analysis that we do is called a site response analysis. And we're going to dabble with site response analysis a little bit later in the semester, but uh, for the time being, um, we're just going to learn about it. Uh, so as an engineer, when should you consider performing this type of analysis? Well, here are my rules of thumb that I would use in, in my own practice. Uh, the first is whenever I have a structure whose natural period is greater than uh, half a second and the average shear wave velocity in the soil in the upper 30 meters or the upper 100 feet is less than uh, 200 meters per second or so. Um, the second is if I have a structure whose natural period is greater than half a second and I have any soil layer in my soil profile that has the potential to liquefy uh, across my site. And the reason that is the case is because even if I have a thin soil layer that's maybe a, uh, two feet, three feet thick, and it liquefies, it acts like a giant filter. And it will amplify the ground motions, even though it's only a couple feet thick it will amplify those high period ground motions and filter out the low or the, uh, the low period ground motions or the high frequency stuff. Um, third is anytime you have any critical structure built on soil and your average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters is less than about 270 meters per second. Hey, now again, this isn't written in code anywhere. This is, this is my uh, own personal uh, experience, just learned through practice, and, and those are my rules of thumb. Okay, uh, let's go to the second one. This is uh, directivity and directionality. Now, we've talked a little bit about directivity um, earlier in the semester, uh, 
uh, when we compared it to the Doppler effect. And so uh, you can go back and learn more about it uh, in that uh, lecture. But um, because we're going to talk a little bit more about what it looks like to account for it in your ground motions. So directivity and directionality, uh, it's important. Maybe what I'll do is uh, just model for you uh, what these are again. So uh, if I have a, 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 say I'm a bird and I'm looking down on the ground and I have a fault that runs like this. So this is in plan view. And let's say that uh, the fault ruptures right there. It looks more like a flower than a rupture, but there you go. All right, so if the fault begins to rupture right there and the rupture propagates along the fault, what's going to happen is every time the, uh, that rupture propagates, as the fault breaks and as asperities break, you get the, uh, the uh, breaks along the fault that, that just start happening as, as that rupture propagates along the fault. And every time the rock breaks, it releases more and more and more waves. So this is going to look messy here pretty soon. And so uh, all those waves continue to propagate and move. And, and what ends up happening, if you'll recall, is... Um, is what we showed, you know, I think it just made more sense if I just show it to you. Uh, -up -up -up. Is it in this lecture here? No, nope. next one. I could try to draw the figure for you, but it's not going to look very pretty. Yeah, here it is. This one right here. So uh, this, this figure right here demonstrates really well what's going on with directivity. So every time new rupture occurs and new waves are emanated, um, in the direction of the rupture, you get a big stacking of energy. And that stacking of the energy, uh, just like the Doppler effect, is can be, uh, changes the... Uh, in essence, the frequency of that loading. And it can also uh, affect the intensity or the amplitude of it. And so um, that big pulse of energy can cause a tremendous amount of damage. So uh, that is the... That is the... Um, uh, that's directivity. Now... If I go back to my messy drawing and I just erase everything and we get back to one little earthquake. Now if I look at just one uh, break and the waves that are emanated from that break, if, if I had, let's say, recording instruments that were um, oriented in different orientations, Let's say that I had a location right here and I had all of these instruments located right at this one location, okay? And they were all oriented in different, in different uh, orientations. And I were to draw the response spectra for all of these different uh, instruments. Here's the crazy thing. So uh, these are period T on this axis and then on this axis this is spectral acceleration and g what i might see in each of these would be uh, you would expect them to be very similar because they're in the exact same location recording the exact same earthquake but uh, they're not going to be similar in fact depending on the orientation of the instrument I'm going to record a different ground motion. I'm going to record a different earthquake. And so 
the, the orientation that I'm recording those ground motions, uh, or maybe I should say the orientation of the earthquake waves themselves, that's what we call directionality. And in one of these orientations, there's going, and at each period, there's going to be an orientation that gives me the maximum peak at, at each period, okay? And so, so each period in my response spectrum has an orientation that has a, a different maximum amplitude in the response spectrum. And so as an engineer, I may be interested to know which orientation is uh, the maximum orientation. So uh, we tend to consider these effects, directivity and directionality, together. We lump them together and, and call them, um, uh, I thought I had that written, but I don't, so I'll just write it in here. We tend to call these things near source effects. So if you ever hear this phrase, near source effects, we're referring to directivity and directionality, uh, usually to lumped together, but they, they really are two different um, phenomena. So let's look at some real life examples. When I deal with directivity, I can have forward directivity, so it's in the direction of the fault rupture, or I can have backwards directivity, which is, a move, which is in the direction opposite or away from the fault rupture. So here's one example of recorded ground motions. This is the Landers 1992 earthquake in Southern California. The earthquake started right here and it, it largely went in this direction, okay, went to the north. Now, I've got a station located to the north called GSC, and then I got a station located to the south called PFO. And each of these, they're about uh, almost the same distance away from the rupturing fault. And so they recorded ground motions, uh, but the ground motions they recorded, even though they're about the same distance away, are, are drastically different. Here's the accelerations that were recorded at GSC, and here are the accelerations that were recorded at PFO. And they look like totally different earthquakes, don't they, when you look at them? Look at the velocity records. The velocity records we see uh, GSC has a big peak, and PFO, nothing, just kind of wiggles. And in the displacement records, yeah, there it is. GSC has a velocity pulse, okay? And a PFO, or a displacement pulse, excuse me, and PFO has nothing. So um, these pulses, you guys, are what we call directivity pulses. And yet they have a little, usually blip down and then a big jump up. And we tend to see them uh, blip up, big drop down. We tend to see them in the velocity and the displacement time histories. And it's these pulses of velocity and displacement that just wreak havoc on uh, a lot of infrastructure, especially anything that has a higher um, natural period of frequency or a natural period of vibration. So uh, in general, forward directivity is, is the scary uh, thing that we worry about with directivity. But um, one thing that we can't ignore is that the duration tends to be longer in backward directivity. So even though the amplitude of our uh, intensity, the amplitude of our motions is not as great as it is with forward directivity, the duration of the significant loading is stretched out longer uh, in backward directivity. Okay, so how do we account for directivity? That's a really good question. There's, it's obviously something that's important, uh, and depending on what our structure is, whether it's uh, a long period or a short period structure, uh, 
uh, we, we will want to look at both forward directivity and backward directivity. So how do we account for it? Uh, well, one thing we could possibly do is add uh, artificially a pulse to the velocity response spectrum. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys have done this yet, but uh, in um, seismo signal, you can plot, um, of course, you know, let's turn off my emails. There you go. You can plot uh, spectral acceleration, and those will look, you know, something like this. But you can also plot spectral velocity. And spectral velocity will always look something like um, this. And, um, and so what we could try to do is we could try to come into the spectral velocity plot and artificially adjust it so that for the appropriate periods that are high we could try to modify it to properly account for that pult that we saw in the velocity time history and yeah that sounds great the problem is that um, to modify that velocity uh, response spectrum is pretty tricky to do and it's even trickier to do correctly. There we go. And so, uh, and the reason for that is because we, we don't want to just throw numbers in there willy-nilly. We want to put numbers in there that are realistic and numbers that are representative of actual earthquakes. So we can go to our, uh, we can do it empirically and, and we can look at earthquake records and things and, and, and that's fine. That's something that, that we can do, um, but it's just not done by a lot of people. So another thing that we could possibly do is if we were using, uh, if we were doing some sort of dynamic analysis, like a site response or a, a structural dynamic model, and we were requiring earthquake time histories, then we could just select time histories that already have these directivity pulses in the recording. So these, these ground motion instruments experience that directivity pulse. And so we can just use those and, and run those through our, our model, whatever the model is. And so uh, this is a really popular approach. It's very common. Uh, and when we do that, and we're selecting time histories that have directivity in them, we want to make sure that we're selecting time histories with both uh, forward directivity and other time histories that have backward directivity. Because again, the forward directivity gives you the big kick in the, uh, in the higher periods in terms of velocity and displacement. But backward directivity usually has a longer duration. And so we want to uh, account for them. And then another thing we can do is uh, simply apply these directivity multiplier functions to the acceleration response spectrum. And this is uh, also very popular. It's very common to do. Um, it, it, this may sound a little bit like the first one, but uh, for whatever reason, we're more comfortable modifying the acceleration response spectrum than we are the velocity response spectrum. So um, note, by the way, that the first two, uh, they do require actual time histories. Uh, the third doesn't, and that's one of the reasons that it's uh, pretty popular. So um, I've usually done the third one myself a lot in practice. Um, let's talk a little bit about directionality. Okay, So in, when we talk about directionality, again, this is um, how the intensity of the ground motions change depending on the orientation of the ground motions relative to the rupturing fault. Now, typically, um, what we're going to do is we're going to modify the acceleration response spectrum. And in the past, historically, we've used what are called modification ratios uh, 
to alter the response spectra. So a modification ratio is simply a ratio that says, OK, um, my ratio is equal to the, um, the orientation I'm interested in, maybe fault normal, divided by the, the average uh, value of, of considering all orientations. So that are the average of all the, the different directionalities. So um, all I need to do then is multiply the average ground motion by whatever this ratio is, and voila, I get the, um, the increased um, ground motion uh, according to the, the maximum directionality. So uh, this idea was originally uh, proposed in the late 90s, early 2000s by legends uh, Norm Abramson, Paul Somerville. Uh, later, Abramson uh, modified it. And, and all of these, these, these models that did this, they, they were all based on two um, orientations, either normal to the rupturing fault or parallel to the rupturing fault. And, uh, and so it was widely believed that the fault normal orientation gave the strongest ground motions and fault parallel orientation gave the weakest motions. Now, these models uh, are not easy to compute by hand. And, and so typically, they were computed by a, a computer that was also doing the, um, the seismic hazard analysis and it was just added into the seismic hazard analysis. So if I wanted then to compute the fault normal acceleration, uh, instead of just the average, what I would do is I would take my ratio that I would compute from whatever these models were, and I would just multiply it by um, the spectral acceleration value at the appropriate period. So again, these ratios are, are a function of the period. So it, it's not just one constant number. Um, different periods have different ratios or different multipliers by them. And, and bear in mind that these ratios really only apply to periods that are greater than half a second. Um, anything that is less than half a second, the ratio is, is always equal to 1. So we, it, it doesn't really affect it. But for these longer period stuff, directionality makes a big deal, um, it, at least in the response spectrum. So uh, in my experience, what I've typically seen is that that fault normal ratio from these models ranges anywhere from 1 to 1.5. So think about that. With 1.5, you're increasing your ground motions by 50% just due to the maximum orientation of those ground motions. And so, you know, that, that's a big deal. For the fault parallel, um, the, the ratio ranges from anywhere from 1 to 0 0.85. So we're potentially reducing the, the response spectrum up to 15%. Um, now, we, I, I cited these Abramson and Somerville models. And uh, when we use the NGA West models, however, nobody really uses those Abramson and Somerville models anymore. They're not really appropriate. Uh, instead, everyone uses uh, a model developed by Shahi and Baker in 2014. Um, and it will give you uh, the maximum directionality uh, or, or the maximum rotated ground motions. The interesting thing, though, that, that Baker pointed out is that um, in their statistical analysis, that maximum rotated ground motion does not always align with the fault normal orientation. Sometimes it's a little bit off fault normal. And so this, this kind of long-standing belief that fault normal is the maximum direction of, of ground motions, uh, they've basically shown that that's not really true. So here's a figure that I pulled from an actual analysis that I did as a consultant uh, years ago. Um, I, I know it's not like grandiose, but you can see that at a period of half a second, uh, 
um, the, these response spectra split. And I've got a fault normal response spectrum. I've got a fault parallel response spectrum. And then I've got the mean or the average. And so um, you can see that the fault normal response spectrum is, is uh, approximately 25% larger than the mean response spectrum. And then the fault parallel response spectrum is maybe, uh, in this case, 5 or 10%, well, about 5% smaller than the mean uh, response spectrum. So uh, it's, it's something that we want to uh, take into account, again, when we are um, trying to be as accurate as possible as predicting the ground motions that our site could experience. Uh, accounting for directionality and directivity are, are really important, these near source effects. And again, remember that, that this directivity and directionality effects, they're really only going to affect uh, periods in your response spectrum that are greater than half a second. These low period, high frequency uh, portions of the response spectrum, they, they don't really affect those. So, uh, back to my rules of thumb, when should we account for near source effects, directivity and directionality? Well, um, here are my rules of thumb. Um, Number one is when your structure has a, a natural period of vibration larger than half a second and you're located within 10 kilometers of an active fault. Because remember, near source effects, they have nothing to do with the soil type. They have everything to do with your proximity to the rupturing fault. And that's it. It doesn't matter if you're on gravel, sand, clay. The, the soil is inconsequential. It's your location relative to the rupturing fault that, that affects near source effects. So uh, that's the first one. And the second would be any critical structure located in an area of moderate to high seismicity. And the reason for that is we don't necessarily know where the faults are. And if you're in an area of moderate to high seismicity, the chances are there's, there's probably a fault beneath your feet anyway. And if that fault goes, uh, you could potentially experience these near source effects yourself. Now, it may surprise a lot of people to learn that the um, ground motions that are computed by the U.S. Geological Survey and provided for free to the public for use in like um, building code they do not consider directionality and directivity effects. They don't consider near source effects. Uh, I don't understand why, they, they just don't. And so um, that makes it challenging because new revisions of the code, uh, the IDC 2018, uh, in, for example, requires that um, a ground motion hazard analysis accounts for near source effects. And so uh, we're kind of in this uncomfortable position right now uh, as, as the code uh, is, is getting learned and, and engineers are getting comfortable with it. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that in the next lecture, but um, it, it's a tricky spot right now and we're all still trying to figure it out. But, but just be aware that uh, if you want to consider near source effects, and, and you should, if you're trying to um, comply with code, uh, you're going to have to add those effects into your response spectra yourself. Okay, let's talk about the third local site effect, and this is uh, topographic effects. Now, uh, topographic effects, there, it, 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 it's kind of intuitive if you think about it. So if you go take a uh, like a, a stick or a reed and you hold it up and you kind of whip it back and forth, you can whip and crack the end of that, that stick or that reed. And so there's a whipping effect whenever you have um, a, a protruding topography. Uh, 
And the same is true uh, when we just have the surface of the Earth. So uh, as we see down here in my bottom left, if I have a, a hill or a mountain or a, a, a steep slope, and I'm located up here at the peak, the and, and I have an earthquake ground motion come into uh, and shake the bottom of that thing, so the whole thing starts moving, the top of this peak is going to get whipped. And so the displacement that I experience at the top versus the displacement that I might experience at the bottom, this displacement is much greater than uh, this displacement down here because of the whipping effect that occurs. And so, um, you know, we know this just intuitively, but mathematically we can try to explain it. Uh, and, and really what happens is if, if you think about, you know, there's waves over here and there's waves over here and there's waves over here, all of those waves just converge, converge, converge into a single point. And, and what we end up having mathematically is, is an infinitely large amount of energy focused on that single point right on the peak. And so we end up getting um, some pretty large displacements uh, at the apex of that peak. So um, interestingly though, the math uh, rarely matches what actually happens in the field and that's because there's other effects in play like 3D effects and, and damping and attenuation of the energy and things like that but but at least they get us uh, in the ballpark so if we want to account for these topographic effects uh, how do we do it? Uh, well <laughs> the truth is we usually don't we usually don't just because it's hard to do it accurately and to date uh, the only way to get even close is, is you need to run uh, a beefy numerical simulation. And uh, for most projects, that's, that's well outside the scope of what we're trying to accomplish. And so uh, usually we don't. We don't account for it. Should we? Uh, well, in, in my experience in, in the reconnaissance I've performed around the world in the last few years, uh, I've definitely noticed the pattern that uh, the largest damage often is concentrated around the, the slopes and on the tops of the slopes and the peaks. Uh, you know, human beings are interesting creatures. We like to live up high. We like to look out and have great views and look down on all the people that we perceive to be less than us. And so everybody likes to build on the mountains or on the benches way up high. And, and what we've learned from uh, experience when it comes to earthquakes is those are often the places that get sh uh, shaken the hardest. So um, yeah, that may not satisfy you to say that we don't consider these things typically. Uh, maybe someday we will, but uh, currently uh, we just we know that this is a factor. We kind of uh, account for it just uh, in our judgment, but uh, we don't really assign any numbers to it. Okay, the last effect that uh, I'm going to talk about is called basin effects. And this is a big one. So um, what is a basin? A basin is, is basically a valley, right? Uh, so if I take a cross section, for instance, of Utah Valley, where Brigham Young University is, I may have um, the Wasatch Mountains off to the east, then I have the valley. Uh, I even have the, the you know, Utah Lake right here. Um, and then on the other side, I've got the uh, Ochre Mountains. And, you know, these bedrock come down and, and at some point they intersect. And so uh, we have this valley, this sediment filled valley. And, and this right here, my friends, is what a basin looks like. Think of it like a giant bell or a bull meaning that um, energy can come in and, and come to this other side and bounce back and forth. Or if, if once energy gets inside of the soil and, and it starts going out in all directions, it hits the rock and it reflects and it just vibrates and reflects back and forth. Kind of like the ringing of a bell. Uh, and so that's why oftentimes basin effects are, are likened to the ringing uh, of a bell. 
And uh, a lot of the same physics apply, but um, I'm going to talk about one particular uh, aspect of basin effects. Uh, so you, you get, of course, the, the reflection and the, the echoing of these, these ground motion waves as the waves reflect and bounce back and forth off these walls. But there's, there's another effect that is associated with basin effects. And uh, it deals with the surface waves, particularly the Rayleigh waves, that are traveling through the soil. So uh, I've made this little uh, animation here. Here's Rayleigh waves from an earthquake. And they're, they're um, traveling through the soil, and they're in all directions, and these waves are heading. And eventually, uh, the soil starts to get thinner and thinner and thinner as we uh, approach the the rim of the basin and we get to the rock and and as the uh, the soil gets thinner and thinner and thinner these waves um, they want to maintain the same height but the soil gets thinner so notice what happens um, as we get close to this rim it looks like the waves start to kind of rise out of the soil uh, because they're trying to maintain the exact same height uh, the, the exact same amplitude. And so uh, we get an amplification right at the rim of our basin. And that amplification of the waves can be quite significant. Um, and so again, uh, this would be uh, akin to building um, near or on the benches of the basins where in Utah everybody wants to live. Uh, and so those homes are probably going to get uh, larger ground motions than homes that may be out here in the middle of the valley where the basin is, uh, is deeper. Uh, but those homes down there will probably have other problems like soil liquefaction to, to worry about. But right here, this amplification near the edges of that basin, those are what... Um, we want to focus on here for these basin effects. So uh, numerically, we're pretty good at estimating these basin effects. We can we can capture them pretty well in our numerical models, um, particularly in shallow basins. But we struggle with uh, a couple things. We struggle trying to capture the those edge effects that I was just showing uh, in that previous slide. And we capture, uh, we struggle trying to capture the behavior of deep basins. Uh, and, and the problem is because there is uh, just so much uh, soil to try to characterize dynamically that um, we, we have a hard time capturing all of it. And so because of our inability uh, to characterize deep basins due to our lack of knowledge, we're often wrong. So uh, when it comes to different types or the different areas, when, when we're in California, what types of basins do we tend to see? We tend to see shallow basins in California. But what about the uh, Salt Lake Valley? Or even worse, Utah Valley. Utah Valley uh, is, is even more severe than Salt Lake Valley. Yeah, it, those are very deep basins, particularly Utah Valley. Um, Salt Lake Valley will have a depth of about, a soil depth of uh, up to about uh, anywhere between 700 meters to maybe 1.5 kilometers in depth until you hit bedrock. But when you get down into Utah Valley by where we are at BYU, we can get up to three kilometers depth before we hit bedrock. And so uh, that is really deep when it comes to uh, these deep basins. So, folks, that's the end of the presentation today. I hope you learned a little bit about uh, local uh, side effects and how they can amplify or de-amplify the ground motions uh, from an earthquake and then how we try to account for them uh, when we predict ground motions using attenuation relationships. Uh, thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon.